Hey, welcome back Design Squad and in this Action Noob to Master series, I'm gonna talk a little bit more on the process and methods and you know, the approach to prototyping with Action. And in particular, I'm gonna talk to you about 10 mistakes designers make when prototyping with Action. Once I see when let's say coaching other people or sharing my uh, prototypes with others or just you know, onboarding anyone who wants to go in deep with actual prototyping and do it well. And so, number one is while learning Axure, people tend to focus specifically on tool itself and not what it can do for you. And so it's it's usually something like, oh, I just wanna, you know, learn how to work with this primary button component instead of following a use case. A use case would be creating a form which allows you to sign in and wherefore you need to learn how to do buttons and forms and input fields. And then you learn it because it's specific to your design issue at hand, at problem at hand. And that's how, you know, we as people, we learn it that way. We don't just learn for the sake of it. It's always driven by either curiosity or problem at hand. People are like, oh, I just need to learn how to do dynamic panels. And I'm like, well, why do you really need that? Maybe dynamic panel is not the right approach in that case. Case. think of what you want to achieve and then walk from there and ask experts of how to do it simple as that next is the one which is kind of like if you watch my videos in actual noob to master you probably notice that i tend to name my object so let's see here if i clicked on sign in it's button plus plus button one that's a conventional statement i use you know plus plus means that it's interactive object i've created and it's gonna mean something i need to either target it or it's gonna be clickable or it has an action or something like that and so naming it's always smart because let me demonstrate if i wouldn't name anything and i have this button plus plus and now i'm gonna have another 20 buttons like so and then let's say i'm gonna do something like I'm gonna add a new interaction on click, sh like hide. And as you can see, I'm gonna have a lot of button, which is just classic button, or I can have something which is named, which is button. And just to show you what I mean more specifically, if this button has a name of, I don't know, a primary login button or something like that. And um, I have that condition where I need to select the thing. As you can see, it automatically stands out because one, I have a convention and two, it has a name. So I know exactly what I'm targeting and what I'm going to hide when I click on it. And to demonstrate that, boom, when I click it hit that instead of any other button because I set it to and I gave it a name. And so names are essential. You need to name everything, like whatever you can name, give it a name because in the end, it's going to save so much time. Next one is quite typical and it's overusing of dynamic panels. Now dynamic panels are amazing. You know, if, if you've seen any of the videos, you're gonna notice, wait, let me just try to find one. Let's say this is a dynamic panel and inside it I have a couple of states, empty and full, it's a loading bar. But what I tend to see in prototypes, especially from juniors, is that they go ham and just do everything with dynamic panels when, when you don't really need to. So I usually tend to say stick to dynamic panels if there is state one, state two, state three, and you need to switch between those states or you need to animate states or you need to otherwise something out of nothing. Maybe that's the only case because the issue, the real issue is not just that you complicate a prototype for yourself and you need to dig deeper to understand what it is, but it also slows down your prototype. So let's say if you publish it online, it might take a while to load it in. It's not going to be a good user experience when you test it. So you hinder yourself and, and your process and user testing because your prototype is too slow. And so I always say stick to bare necessity of to dynamic panels because they are quite advanced. There is a lot of code underlying to make it happen. And I've seen some prototypes where there were like five dynamic panels and it would just be dynamic panel inside dynamic panel. And all of them were like really similar. It was like something like content container, uh, content header, content yada, yada, yada. And then like a nesting of the components. And 
when I picked that prototype up, I was like, well, I have no idea where to start because it's so complicated and it's so unnecessarily, you know, slow as well. Next is creation of unnecessarily styled states. In one of my prototypes, I think I showed you how you can create a button from scratch, but I also showed you how to create a button from all of the predefined components. This is, let's say, a simple button. Maybe you want yours to be like really custom. However, Axure allows you to customize it anyway. So as you can see, there is mouse over style effect. And then you can just fill different color on a mouse or let's say yellow or orange or something like that. And then you don't have to create a dynamic panel out of it because there is styling options here anyways. And it's almost like every component, as you can see, it works. Every component in Axure is stylable in one way or another. And, and it's same is for text or links. You know, you always have those effects. So here is my style effect. And as you can see, this is just mouse over. If I want more properties, I can enable mouse down, select it. So you don't need to go customize every element. You can just use predefined script based uh, styling options and do so well. And then it's going to be much quicker and it's going to also save you time. Now, next issue is I see a lot of people who, let's say, especially when we get started, they make everything in Axure or they make 100 pages with every state defined. And I always say like, well, why did you do that? Like, why did you go for breath instead of death? And we usually say, oh, wait, well, I mean, I thought that that's what UX design is supposed to be. Well, the reality is that you only prototype to user test something or to validate something or to hand your ideas over to developers, so you know. And so it's always good to go deeper on a specific scenario, on a specific flow. And instead of covering everything, but covering everything on a surface level where you just link pages, well, just use Envision for that. But if you want to go deeper and deeper on a specific page, on a specific flow, on maybe a login scenario, well, that's where we go in depth. And, and that's why I advise, you know, for people to not just prototype everything, choose your weapons, choose where you want to invest your time because it takes time. Maybe you're designing customer experience and you just go for 100 touch points. But if you're UX design, tiny bits is what makes the user experience, you know, delightful and impactful and optimal for the end user. And you need to test on that. And that's where depth matters. Next, and it's about spending too much time on rapid prototyping. Now it's in the name that it's rapid prototyping. And so I see a lot of juniors who spend, let's say, days crafting their prototypes. And to me, it's like, well, one thing is I understand that you might not know all the things and intricacies of the actual tool of hard to prototype. But there is also that perfectionism. Done is always better than perfect or perfect is the enemy of the done and shipped, you know, as all those old adages say. And so there's always a need for you to understand that, let's say, if it's rapid prototyping, it's meant to be really quick. To me, it's almost like if I cannot prototype it in two to four hours, one flow or one key functionality I want to test of users, it's not worth doing it because it's wasteful. It's not going to return you enough, you know, commercial value or insight because you spend so much time. It's almost like it's it, it's rather just hire UX engineer or developer to develop it for you right away and then test it on it and then iterate because it's why UX I think is so almost looked down on because there tends to be a lot of waste a lot of slack and so there is a need to keep it lean and keep it quick and you know when you prototype the depth matters as in previous point but it also matters the quickness, the speed, so you can test and iterate immediately and as fast as you can. And by no means, sometimes, let's say a prototype or days and days, if let's say it's machine learning type of prototype or really data heavy, where you need to simulate real things. And I've been prototyping some bits for weeks until a user tested, but there was a reason. And so if you have a good reason for that, do that, you know, there is, it's a no brainer. But otherwise, just keep it quick, quick it, keep it simple and wrap. Next big one, what I see, you know, juniors and other designers do overuse of actions or underuse of actions. And let's say an, a, an example could be an accordion type of functionality where let's say you have a push pull feature 
which I demonstrated in my previous videos. Instead of moving different things manually, I can just click and move the things. And let me just quickly demonstrate that. And an example of this could be, let's say, accordions, where, you know, in ideal scenario, you use a, a let's say, push and pull function instead of move object to something. And by that, I mean, let's say here, if I click on it, as you can see, it expands this panel, it switches the dynamic panel, but it also pushes everything down instead of telling it manually to say, hey, this box to move down to that position. Hey, this box also move down to that position. It just automatically pushes and pulls. And just to demonstrate exactly what I mean by that declaration here, as you can see, I have set panel state and then I have an option push pull widgets. Alternatively, which is the, you know, the not the right way to do this is I could, I could just also add another action, let's say, and I could tell it move and then select those three objects one by one and two and then specify the pixels and then I go into the weeds. And that's what I mean by this. It's almost like it, it, it takes a little bit of practice to understand what you can do with Factor. I agree with that, but it's also like there are quicker methods to do this and it's much faster for you to prototype again and it's much faster forever. And so I would always look for those shortcuts, but I would always connect it to a use case at hand. You know, again, it goes that full circle where you don't want to learn about the buttons. You want to learn how to create forms for a specific case. Now, next one is the most interesting and the most complicated probably for most people, which is not utilizing variable. And variables is a complicated thing. I can, I totally get it that it's really hard to understand and learn it. I have a few videos of utilizing variables, but they are the most amazing feature in Axur and really why you should choose Axur over any other tool in the market is the ability to add so many variables and, and have local variables, global variables. And, you know, variables are just simply amazing. Let's say in this prototype where I can log in into next page and the next page is going to show me the data. Let me just actually demonstrate is achieved by variables. And so let's say if my username is VA experience and my passport is some garbage and then I log in and as you can see, it tells me VA experience, welcome back. And it's also shown here. It's not that I manually inputted it and baked it in a prototype I could do, but no, this is was achieved by variables. I set that value to a variable and then I read it in the next page. And it's, it's simple, amazing what you can achieve it when you have variables. You can calculate math. You can calculate numbers. You can, you know, do dimensional calculations. You can assign different text input fields. You can save the text. You can export the text. It just, infinite possibilities you almost you get into the actual weeds of a prototyping in a, you know living scenarios rather than just kind of like a fake uh, smoke and mirrors prototyping so if you can invest in one thing in actual i always recommend to invest in understanding variables and how to use those because they're the biggest bang for the buck now the next issue what i see uh, and what mistakes users make well, users, designers make is that they prototype separately for mobile and desktop. Sometimes it makes sense because let's say sometimes you just think that, oh, it's mobile solution and you need to prototype on mobile and then separately you need a totally different experience. However, if it's responsive experience, if it's adaptive experience, you should just use one prototype and, you know, make it responsively. And I see a lot of designers just simply separating, almost having two actual files, one for desktop, one for mobile. And I'm like, well, why? Why do you really need to do that? Because it's so much quicker to just simply prototype in one. And I have a video on how to do that. You just go to style, you go to adaptive views, and then you can define different breakpoints and adjust the content and tell exactly what stays in the same position, what stretches, what remains, what has to adapt in, you know, to different margins and restructure the layout and all those different bits. But my point is like, you don't really have to do that. Think about it like um, I always recommend to go mobile first. So whatever you prototype in action, prototype it with, you know, from the smallest device and then expand and, and, you know, because the smallest device has the, the smallest real estate to play with, the biggest device, you can always add different elements and reuse it that way. And now the next issue or the next, you know, mistake designers make 
is that we don't utilize actual cloud. In the previous videos, I shown you how to do, let's say, Envision type of prototyping, where you can just stitch together, sketch mockups or JPEGs into a sequence and tell a story that way. And so actual clouds allows you to do that. And so if you need, you need just a simple clickable prototype, you don't really need to use Axure as a tool. You can go directly into Axure Cloud, which is app.axure.cloud, log in and verify your account, and then prototype there simply. And here is just as an example from previous bit, you're gonna see that I have this prototype, which I have a build and inspect tools. And so it doesn't just allow me to prototype easier than doing it in Axure because it's such a simple bit, but it also allows me to use different developer handovers and just hand it over for them to implement. And so Axure Cloud has a lot of different capabilities for more of a teamwork, for more of end-to-end -end design uh, integrations and capabilities. It's simply amazing because usually teams work on their different designers, work on different bits. But however, if you really would want to work with other designers, you would need to use Actual Cloud because it allows you to create new workplaces. It allows you to share different Actual files and assets allows for more team working capabilities and versioning and all those bits. And so a lot of different new designers just simply overlook actual cloud. They just skip it altogether and focus on the app at hand. However, depending on your need or your organizational need, it might be a good idea to introduce those other features because it just speeds up all the work you could do with the prototyping. If you know anyone who's learning Axure, just share it with them. It might be useful for them as well, as well as this playlist. As per usual, give a like, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment down below if you have any questions, and I'll see you next time.